Let's praise God that he came, amen? Check to make sure I am on. Test one, two. There we go. How's everyone doing this morning? Christmas time is amazing to celebrate. I love it because it's the one time of the year that we truly begin to remember that God is with us. And that's the series that we're going on. And what that spoken word shared is so true. That it's the beginning of this season that we take a moment to remember that God came down, dwelt among us to save us. How immeasurable that love, how deep that grace that he has given, given us. And before we go into the next uh, week two part of this series, I wanted to draw a couple of more things attention because we are excited to be here on a Sunday to share with you this truth, but there are other things that we're excited for. So just a reminder, I'm just going to throw this out here. You've now heard this two times, that we have a candlelight Christmas service. We're going to have two of them, one on the 23rd and one on the 24th. Christmas Day will be online, so we encourage you, join your families, come together around your TV or your screen, and share Christmas together with us. I'm going to be here for anyone who wants to come in. We're going to be at the gathering place at 10. We're just going to have a place for you to come together in community with there as well. Me and my wife are going to hopefully be there. And then uh, the 21 days of prayer and fasting are beginning in January. This, I can't say it enough, is so important, church. This is taking the first portion of our years to say, Lord, what would you have us do? What would you speak? How would you teach? Because we can go and just do the things, right? We have a good idea of how a year flows nowadays. In fact, even when it throws us a loop, we can figure it out pretty quickly. But when we come and sit before the king and take that time to say, Lord, you speak, you teach, it changes the rest of the year. So just to give you a quick rundown of what this is going to look at, Monday through Thursday, we're going to have live prayer over on Facebook and YouTube or through our website. And then Friday and Saturday, Friday and Saturday, we are going to have a video or a written prayer devotion thought online. And then Tuesday night specifically, we're going to come together at 7 p.m. We're going to come together at 7 p.m. and meet together for a time of reflection, for a time of seeking God in corporate worship. So those are a few things that I just want to let you know about. Really excited, want to invite you guys to those things. But now we get to go into week two of this series, God With Us, celebrating Advent. Who can remember what Melissa said Advent was? Anyone, just go for it. The anticipation of something important, something coming, a person, place, or thing, exactly. So here, when we say Advent, obviously our expectance, our excitement comes from the fact that Jesus came as a child. That this was the start of the cornerstone of our foundational faith. It is the reason we gather together. It's the reason we celebrate is because our lives changed in that manger so many years ago. So Josh talked about last week the incarnation of Jesus in regards to the shepherd, being the guide, being our leader, being our friends. And today I'm going to share about the incarnation of Jesus in regards to being the Lamb of God. Now I know that Josh shared last week and said, you know, sheep, sheep ain't that great. <laughs> sheep kind of just exist and hope they make it. That's not what I'm calling Jesus here. I just want to lay that out right now that theologically that is not sound. What the Lamb of God is talking about is the fact that he is the perfect replacement for our guilt. That Jesus came and was a man, became fully human and fully God, not only because he had to teach us, it's because he had to take our place. And to make sure that Israel understood that, he has a name called the Lamb of God. It was the last, final, and complete sacrifice needed to deal with our sin. And it's a free gift. Amen? Oh, come on. If you're saved, let me hear it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. In fact, speaking of free gifts, so if you guys don't see me around much on Sundays, it's because I'm in the junior high, uh, excuse me, middle school. I've been told it is not junior high out here. That's a Californian thing. In middle school, over there with, with the middle schoolers. And one thing that we do is they answer questions and I chuck Jolly Ranchers at them. So if you're a parent who has a sugared up kid at the end of that, I apologize. But that's how I get their attention in my room. <laughs> Anyways, I wanted to share. So if you guys are in the first front three sections of the auditorium today, go ahead and reach down to the right left leg of your chair. There's a free gift for you, a little Jolly Rancher. 
You guys get a Jolly Rancher if you're up there. Now, don't worry. That's not because I you know, love the front sections more or anything like that. That's because I ran out. I, I thought I bought a bag of just Jolly Ranchers. Turns out it was a variety pack, and you can't hang lollipops. They just fall. So if you guys really want a piece of candy, feel free to, to scour here in the near future. Uh, we've got some spaces left over. Or come see me at the middle school room. Not only will I show you off the cool thing that you guys have helped provide here at the church, a space for middle schoolers, but I'll give you a jo lollipop Jolly Rancher or one of the long ones, okay? So it's worth the wait, I promise. But I wanted to give you guys that free gift because that is what Jesus is to us, the free gift of salvation. So... When we talk about this incarnation, I'm going to do it uh, in kind of three parts today. The first thing I'm going to do is share a story, a testimony from my life where this truth became very, very real to me, very much up in my face and seeing it in person. The second thing I want to do is to go into scripture and teach you from God's word what it meant for Jesus to be the Lamb of God. And then lastly, we're going to wrap up with saying, what is the work that the Holy Spirit is doing in us as we learn about the incarnation of Jesus, the Lamb of God? So the first thing I want to do is share a bit of testimony for me. So if you guys don't know me, I've been a uh, part of a pastor family since I was about seven years old. My dad became a pastor, and obviously I'm still here, so been in it most of my life. But around fifth grade, I don't know what bit me, what I bought into, but I became kind of a punk. And I just decided, you know what? I don't like being the nice kid. I also don't like being punished. So I need to figure out how to make both these things real in my life. So I decided, hey, at school, my parents aren't there. So I can act out in school and come back and be the angel child that they think I am. And this worked out great until my teacher sat me down and said, here's a slip I want you to send to your parents. You're failing in three of your subjects. And your parents need to know. So send this home. I want your parents to sign it to let me know that they have talked to you. I guess this is before the cell phone era. I don't really remember when cell phones became a thing, but they thought they trusted a kid to communicate? <laughs> no. So I went home and started thinking, because I was like, oh no, here comes the punishment. This is the part I don't like. And I got to thinking, I was like, wait a second, I just learned cursive. And I live with my grandmother who has arthritis. So her signature has become simply sloppy cursive. I can do that. And so I decided, I said that my grandma spoke to me, and look, she signed it, Miss Fitzpatrick. She signed it. So my parents have heard about it, so they talked about it, and honestly, they don't care. <laughs> and she said, okay, just pick up your grades. Okay. Didn't happen. This went on for a couple more months to speed up the story, and then one day, I hear a, a name over the intercom, Timothy Parker, to the principal's office. Then I thought I was dead. I go to the principal's office, and there's my dad smiling. And my dad is smiling. He says, hey, son. I was like, hey, dad. He's like, first off, you're not in trouble because he saw my face, I'm sure. And he said, I want to take you bowling. Really? Yeah, I want to take you bowling. So he took me out of school early. We went bowling. He bought pizza, bought soda, all of it. It was a great day. And I was like, man, life is good. And my dad sat me down. He's like, son, I just wanted to do this because you know I love you, right? Yeah, dad, I know. He's like, cool. And you know that will never change. No matter what you do, no matter what life does, I will always love you just like this. Do you understand? Yeah, Dad, I understand. Cool. Son, is there anything you want to tell me? Yeah, see, all y'all know. I didn't. <laughs> no, Dad, I'm good. Son, one more time. I love you no matter what. Is there anything you want to tell me? Nah, Dad, it's all good. Everything's good. All right. Son, can I tell you what I know? And then I knew. He says, son, I know that you have been forging my mother's signature. I know you've been lying to me and your mom. I know that you've been lying to your grandmother. I know you've been lying to your teacher. And believe it or not, all that bad stuff doesn't really hurt me at all. What hurts me is the fact that there's something wrong in your heart. There's something that you thought after all of the love that me and your mother have ever lavished on you, that you thought that this was the answer, that this was what life was supposed to be a lie, a fake facade you bring home. And Tim, that kills me and your mother because something was missed in our parents, parenting to you. And so I break down crying, Dad, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He's like, Tim, I know, I know you're sorry, but I think you're sorry that you got caught. And that is a hard issue too. 
So this is what I'm gonna do. I wanna show you what changes the heart of an issue. It's not a punishment. Me and your mom were talking and our first instinct was take away his video games, don't let him hang out with friends. He comes home, does his homework, goes to bed, comes out, eats dinner, goes back to his room. That was our punishment. But as we prayed and sought the Lord, do you know what I felt? Me and your mom thought that is just fixing behavior. It doesn't fix the heart. What changes the heart? He said, Jesus does. So this is what I'm going to do for you, son. I'm going to be punished for you. He says, I'm going to come home from work. I'm going to go to my room and pray for you. I'm going to come out and eat dinner and not talk. And then after I'm done with dinner, go to my room and pray for you. In the morning, I will leave for work and repeat this for three weeks. Because that was what your punishment was from us. No, dad, I don't want it. He's like, I know I don't want it, son. But it's what we're going to do. And so for three weeks, he would come home, go to his room, pray for me, come out, eat dinner, go to his room, pray for me. Three weeks. And it was torture because Survivor was on and we did that as a family. And I would sit there watching it and I couldn't even pay attention because all I thought was dad should be here. And he's not here because of what I did. And then it started to change. No, it's not because of what I did. It's because I didn't care. I didn't care what I was doing to my relationship with my family. And now that it's actually broken, now I'm caring. After three weeks, he comes home, sits down next to me. Hi, son. I broke down again. <laughs> Jesus changes everything by taking on the punishment that we deserved. And why I get so excited about sharing this message with you is because in that moment, I saw it for real off one bad thing that was in my heart. And looking at myself as a human being, I realized that even more things are wrong and Jesus has taken on and said, it's gone. For those who claim Jesus is Lord and believe he is who he is and he did what he did. And that is why we celebrate this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. So that's just a bit of my testimony of how this became very real to me. And now I'm excited to share the scripture portions that present this truth to us. So we're reading in Romans 3.25 just to show how perfect this plan was. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished, Romans 3.25. So this is why I love this passage is it shows his forbearance. In middle school, we have this thing that, uh, again, I said I checked the Jolly Rancher for right answers. The one answer they always try to pull up on me to see if it's correct is Proto-Evangelium. And what Proto-Evangelium means, it's the first expression of the evangelistic message in Scripture. And that's actually all the way back in Genesis 3. And why that's so exciting is because God never came up with a plan. He had the plan. In his forbearance, the reason why history exists and why Jesus came when he did at the fullness of history is because God isn't slow as some expect slowness. God always had a plan. And we just get to celebrate when it finally took off. This is the promise that we have in scripture is that God never reacted to us. He always said, now when this happens, I am ready. I prepare a way for you. I create a place for you to sit. If you would receive it by faith. Always, always the plan was Jesus. We're going to go into the next portion of scripture. And this is a long one. If you guys are following along on the notes, there's sections of them. And I encourage you to take notes between each one. Or if you're here in the morning and you're in the physical Bibles on your phone, we're going to read the entirety of Isaiah 53 and kind of break it up. Because it shows the complete work of Jesus. Yes, we are celebrating that he came as a baby. And that's amazing because there's going to be things in the scripture that shows he had to experience everything we have as humans. So he must, he had to come as a baby. But really what my excitement is the fact of the fulfillment of God's plan, the redemption we have through the cross. So beginning in Isaiah 53, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance was, uh, there was nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. First off, he was born in a manger. 
Nothing surprising except to say, ew. If you guys have ever worked with farm animals, it's never pretty to be around where they eat and finish what you do after eating. This is where Jesus, there was no beauty about him there. He grew up with God uh, in favor of God and man. This is what it means when it says that he grew up like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He was recognized as being good in regards to those standards. He grew in favor with God and man, and he needed to, to experience the fullness of our existence as humans. Another thing I love to point out is the fact that he was uh, he came from Nazareth, and even one of the disciples said, what good can come from that area? <laughs> Wait, you're, you're saying that this, this is where the Messiah is coming from? Pfft. Yeah, right, that region stinks. There was nothing to attract us to him in his appearance. This is what Jesus did. Moving on in Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Just going to list off of a few things that Jesus experienced while he was here on earth. He was rejected by the very people who were supposed to recognize him as the Messiah, the Pharisees. He lost loved ones, his father, his friend Lazarus. He was betrayed by his friends, Judas being the ultimate example of betrayal, but also his followers fled from him. Even before then, when he gave a hard teaching, there were thousands that were like, uh, nope, I'm going to go back to find John the Baptist, see where he's at. He was rejected by those who were supposed to recognize him. And finally, he was cursed on a tree. Paul teaches that it was cursed to be hung on a tree. The tree was the cross. He took on the worst possible death he could in that time, which I believe is one of the reasons why it was the fullness of history, because it was marking all of the marks in prophecy of saying this time is the only time every prophecy could be fulfilled because God had a plan from the beginning, the worst possible death available at that time. Moving on. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering Yet we consider him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. It was said of him that he was from Satan. The Pharisees himself called him a blasphemer, that he worked through the power of Baal. He was physically beaten, maimed beyond recognition, and literally pierced on the cross, in his side, all for that last line. Because we have those things in our lives. And he had to experience every single part in order to be this perfect Passover lamb, this lamb of God. So why do we need this? Isaiah 53. All in one passage, guys, I encourage you, just dive into scripture and see how it applies to Jesus. Just look into it and say, Lord, where do I find your promises? Where do I find your son? Where do I find your preparation of where God is working out life and happy, or, uh, joy and peace and kindness? Where is he developing his plan? Because like I said, from Genesis 3, he revealed it's always been the plan. Because this is just one passage and it's awesome, but, but keep reading the Bible. Anyways, I digress. We all, say that, we all. So you may be good, but we all. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so did he not open his mouth. He didn't defend himself, church, when he would have been fully justified to do so. He would have been fully justified to call the angels down and take him off the cross if it was his will to do so because he is God. But he submitted to the heart of the Father and surrendered his will so that the Lord's will would be done. Even though he was justified, he stayed up there for our iniquity and didn't defend himself. Moving on. By oppression and judgment, he has taken away Yet who, or he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? 
For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression on my, of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. The Lord was never out of control. I want you to notice that. That God was never like, ooh, I guess wicked, wickedness won here. I'm kind of out of control here. Hopefully it works out at the end. It was the Lord's will that he would be punished for the sake of his people so that the price may be paid in full. And yes, he was counted among the wicked in his death. He was crucified with two thieves on either side. And he was counted among the rich in his death because he was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, a new tomb. Those things were expensive back in the day. You bought family tombs, so a new tomb, a new cave, untouched, was expensive. Counted among the rich. Now, I also read that too, prophetically. His death is the richest thing at that moment. Because where Satan thought he had won, the Lord was already working. God already had a plan. He was already doing something big. We'll get there. Next. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And, he, uh, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light, and after, uh, see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Here's the good news, church. Didn't stay dead. He was expected to. Remember, they bought a tomb. They put him behind a rock. They were coming to anoint his body. There was no conspiracy to make this look like Jesus survived. They thought, this is it. I guess we missed the Messiah. He's going to stay dead. Let's figure this out. But he rose again after three days. There's a time when Jesus' name is going to be glorified above all. There's a time where his righteousness will be fully present before the world. And Jesus will be the name above all names. Until then, he's interceding for us. We're going to go back here into the last part of Isaiah 53. He's praying for us. He's working in our lives the work of his hands. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the greats, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life onto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Family, I want you to understand this. He is interceding constantly for those he paid the sins for. The way I read this is like this. Even for people who haven't accepted him as Lord yet, he's on his knees before God praying. Why? Because my forgiveness is available. Because life is available. I paid for it all if only they would accept it by faith. So what is Jesus' response but... Father, forgive them. That's my Lord. Showing deep humility and praying for me when I actively go against him in my selfishness, in my pride, in my weakness. And he's saying, I will work in that because I am still strong. I will show you that I prepare a table in the presence of your enemies so you don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to walk in pride to show yourself as powerful or strong. Why? Because you rest in me. Why? Because I paid for it. Why are you trying to work to something that's been paid for? Part of me would say, well, Lord, because I still feel there's something to earn. I know I don't deserve it, so I, I've got to do something to, to look better, to be better, because surely it can't be free gift. But he says this, Jesus' righteousness has appeased the wrath of God. Every time I feel I operate underneath this, I'm forgetting that Jesus' righteousness is over me. That his blood makes me pure as snow and clothes me in a white garment. That he speaks truth and life into me. And even when I fall short, remember, his sacrifice came at the fullness of history. There's nothing I can do that he didn't already see. And he says, Tim, by faith, by faith, you can accept this righteousness for it has appeased the wrath of God. Ephesians 1.7 
In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance to the riches of God. I want you to look at this verse, church, and, and tell me where it says that it has anything to do with me. Good. Because where I read it, it says it's in accordance to the riches of, of God's grace, which has no height, has no depth. It's endless. And if I truly believe in this, then what does it do? It makes me respond in faith and say, okay, Jesus, I know who you are, who you said you are. I know you did for me what you said you're going to do. And now, Holy Spirit, teach me what it means to walk in accordance to faith. And at every point you're teaching me, let me realize it's not by effort. It's not by trials. It's not by trying. It's by surrender. Because if I walk in surrender in faith, a few things happen. The first thing is this. Jesus continues to show mercy to us. Amen. Right, church? Because last time I checked, when I said the salvation prayer and started walking it out, I didn't get it right 100% of the time. Can anyone say amen to that? Yeah, we're a church full of people. We have issues. We have struggles. We have worries. Jesus continues to show mercy to us. Hebrews 2.17. For this reason, he, has, uh, he was made to be like them. He's, uh, Jesus made to be fully human. Fully human in every way. In order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. That he might make atonement for the sins of his people. Remember why it's exciting for him to be a baby. He experienced the entire breadth of human existence. Now, yes, he didn't have all the technology. He didn't have all of the things that our world currently has, but he experienced everything, pain, loss, struggle, mourning, anger, yet never sinned. Why? So he could have mercy. He's on his knees, and when we pray to him, he's like, I know. I understand fully, and I have something better for you because I'm faithful. I won't turn away. The Father has never turned away from us, and Jesus, being fully God, has never turned away. He is faithful to us. When we begin to walk out in this thing called faith, in this pursuit of Jesus as Lord, he continues to show mercy to us. The last thing he does is this. Jesus invites us to the freedom of forgiveness. This is part of following the Holy Spirit, church. We get to receive, and we thank him for that faithfulness and that mercy, and that's why we spend a large majority of today praising him for that gift. But it gives us an opportunity for something beyond just salvation and working out. He, he offers us new life. The scripture says life abundant, so that their joy may be full. He invites us into the freedom of forgiveness, and he began teaching about this long before he was resurrected. In fact, his disciples once came to him and said, hey, how many times must I forgive people? Seven times, right? Peter thought he was being super, super awesome. They're like, hey, seven's pretty good. Imagine someone wronged you seven times and I say seven. I mean, eight, you know, let's call it. And Jesus says, no, 77 times seven. And I'm sure Peter started counting. But really what he was saying, endlessly. Endlessly forgive. He taught this. Or I think of the woman caught in adultery. He could have, and this blows my mind, in full justification of the law and the fact that it was established by his word, he could have said, yeah, stoner, by the law. But his heart was to show the heart of the Father and show mercy and forgiveness and show what life operating in this looks like. Fine, if you've never sinned, cast the first stone. Why? Because it's not about the law. It's about surrender. It's about your heart. And every time you come into the temple, know that you're operating in mercy. You're operating in grace. Because if we were going by letter of the law, none of you would be here. Another thing he did is in his own life, he showed this freedom of forgiveness. I quoted it yes, uh, a couple minutes ago. While he was on the cross and they were mocking him, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. They knew what they were doing in action. They knew they were killing a man. They knew that they were doing something they thought, thought were fully justified, but it was out of anger and retribution. They knew, but Jesus saw the heart. They don't know who I am. They're responding as they think they're gonna respond. So Father, 
forgive them. They know not what they're doing. Man, I look at my life, church, and there's some times that I can't say that I do that. Father, I know they're just reacting out of pain. They're reacting out of struggle and hurts. Forgive them. They know not what they're doing. But Jesus was able to operate in that freedom and fully pursue the plan that he had in his life, that God has established his life for, because he was operating in the freedom of forgiveness. So how does this apply to us? Proverbs 19.11 says this, a person's wisdom yields patient. It is one's glory to overlook an offense. Why is it glory? Because only by God, church. We don't do this as like, yeah, we've never been offended. (laughs) We've never been hurt. Life is great. Hallelujah. No. I work with with, uh, the young, young ones, and I believe they would tell you that that doesn't appeal at all. The whole cover your eyes and pretend like nothing's good. Just just say it's all happy and act like it's all happy and then go into your room and cry. That's not appealing. What is the fact of like, no, all those things happen. All those things hurt. I was damaged. I was hurt. But I choose to overlook the offense. Why? Because it's God's glory. Because only by God is that possible. By Only by God is that healthy. Being able to follow the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, what does it look like? What does forgiveness look like in this situation? Without perpetuating a habit, without creating a cycle. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a counselor. I can't answer that. But do you know who does and chooses to lead me in those things? God. Through the Holy Spirit, which, by the way, rose Jesus from the dead. And that same power resides in you. For those who have surrendered to Jesus' Lordship. Another way is to say it is this, Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, an offense. And do not give the devil a foothold. Friends, you have an enemy. It's not circumstances. It's not happenstance. It's not, well, this is just how it's always been. You are claimed by God. I want you to hear that. You are claimed by God, and that makes your enemy scared and angry and frustrated. And then he begins to initiate a plan to kill, steal, and destroy everything that the Lord is establishing in your life. So we have to actually be aware of his attacks and choose to operate in this freedom. And this is just one facet, guys. There's so many other things that the Lord can empower you to do that he can walk with you in. And it takes a supernatural touch. I'm young, pretty young. And as I walk out in this life, I realize more and more how absolutely dependent I am on God because if I do it in my own strength, if I do it in my own wisdom, I hurt people. I hurt myself. I put the burden on my shoulders and try to carry it. It's not enough. And what I have to keep reminding me is this. Do we think about this? I'm doing it more. God's literally with us now in this place. Regardless of the songs we sing, regardless of the time we spend in this room, regardless of whether or not we have events, God's with me. And he's he's moving in that truth in us. And he's speaking to you now. And church, I offer you this recognition. It's not the choice I offer. It's what God's given you. And I'm just going to bring it out on the table right now. He's saying, will you trust me? I paid for your sins. Do you trust me to not live as if you're under God's wrath anymore? Because you are favored. You are beloved. Why? Because I'm with you. And then out of that freedom, I invite you into something deeper. Yes, that is great for your spirit and your eternal home. But you can begin to experience that new life now if you would choose to do this. Forgive as I forgave. I'll teach you how to do it. It may be hard. There may be times where you say, no, I have to defend. I have to stand against. Would you pray and seek me first? Would you allow me to teach you? Because by taking on an offense that he was fully justified to fight, Jesus saved our souls. 
we can operate in that same freedom, church. As I close in prayer, I invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Nothing special about this position, but it shows that you show care and love for others around you who may be struggling with the idea of how being a welcome uh, family and an environment really looks like right now. So thank you for showing love and care for others. And I'm saying God with us and forgiveness. And you're in that place where I don't even know Jesus yet. And you're saying he empowers all of this? That he works in all this? Well, how does that start? It starts by recognizing that he is God in the flesh. That he came to this planet not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for you. And that he wants to work that out in your life. He doesn't just want to give you a new eternal home. He wants to give you a new life now. So if you've never accepted Jesus and you feel the calling on the Holy Spirit right now as it begins to burden your heart and you want it more and deeper, then I encourage you this. Raise your hand. I'd like to pray for you. I'd like to pray for you this morning. Thank you for that. Thank you, Jesus. I'm excited. Now, maybe you're here in this place and you've accepted Jesus and he's working on your heart and you felt a little bit of a tinge of a burden to say, you know what, I could do this deeper. I could do this better. Then we're gonna pray this all together because we all need Jesus in this. Dear Lord, I surrender my right to my fight, my right to my pride, because you didn't. You gave your life for the sake of those you loved. So Lord, teach me through your Holy Spirit how to walk out in that. Lord, give me words of wisdom. Give me a heart of love and give me deep insights and understanding into how you would have me live my life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Can we give the Lord praise for the, how he's working on hearts right now? He's speaking new things, he's working new things, and it doesn't stop there. That was just step one. I wanna encourage you guys, this is where I get really excited because we get to do this together now. If you would, <laughs> if you want help in this, there's a few things that you're gonna do as I invite the ushers forward. I want you to fill out a connection card. It's in the seat pocket in front of you. Fill that out. If you have a phone, you could do connection card. Text that to the number 94,000. And the reason why I want you to do this is to say, hey, I made the choice. And that could be the first time salvation with that hand raised, or it could be, hey, I do want to seek this deeper and I need help of learning what it means to do that. Then I invite you to fill that out because there's small groups that can help with that. There's people who would willing to partner with you with that. We want to partner with you on that. If you're online and click that link, let a host know in the chat. We want to pray for you and pray with you and see what that next step looks like. The ushers are going to start passing buckets and they're going to, you can drop it in that. Another thing that I want to thank you church for is for your tithes and offerings. I love the generosity of this church. Not only for outreach and the pursuit of that, but because you guys empower the everyday outreach that happens here in the building. The services that we put on, that we are allowed to welcome people into, that we're able to speak life into is because of your ties. Guys, thank you for your partnership in the ministry. As they pass the offering, I'm gonna pray here because this is what I believe. It's not about the dollar amount. It's about the faithfulness of the hearts that are presenting it. And the Lord multiplies it. So Lord, I thank you for this offering, for these ties that the members of this church are choosing to bless us with, God. And I thank you that in that blessing, our heart is to do whatever it takes to help all people have a relationship with Jesus. God, we want them to introduce, we want to introduce them to you. We want them to find freedom through the small group system, God, not for the sake of just getting names on the board, but for saying that the Lord has moved mightily beyond the Christmas season, beyond the new year, but in every day of their lives, they begin to feel a fresh, a new life, God. So thank you for the partnership of your body. And God, I ask that you would multiply it for the fulfillment of your will. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's worship together, church.